This is Tommy's Outdoors 47, and it's a special episode of the podcast. Special in the sense that I did not plan to have it out today. Actually, you probably hear that the sound is different, and that's because I am traveling and I don't have my recording equipment with me. So I'm using what's available to me, which basically is my laptop. The reason I decided to quickly put together this episode is that there is another act of an important story unfolding right now. The story is going on for a decade, for over a decade, and that story is the illegal killing of hen harriers on grouse moors. So this week, the news broke out again that another hen harrier was killed on a grouse moor. Hen harrier population in the UK is in the critical condition, so obviously this is a big issue. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the matter, I'm going to quickly lay out the background of the story, and then I am joined by the field sport journalist Matt Cross. Matt writes news and features for shooting magazines like Shooting Times and like, Uh, so obviously he's the right person to discuss this issue, and so we dig a little deeper into the matter and talk about why this is happening, and most importantly, what can we do, that includes regular folks, everyday hunters, to stop this from happening, and why it is so important to stop this madness. So just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, I'll give you a few stats. So for example, Between 2007 and 2017, 58 hen harriers were fitted with satellite tags. At the end of the study, only 7 were still alive, out of 58. Only 7. And only 5 of these birds died of natural causes. Another stat is that uh, 7 in 10 hen harriers in the UK is is illegally killed. It's 7 in 10. So, what is the population, you might ask? Well, in 2012, was only 617 pair remained. And that represents a fall of 20% from 2004. So, uh, recent news break out that on the 11th of May this year, another hen harrier was found trapped in a spring trap in Lead Hills Estate. And... um, Obviously, as a result, it died. So that paints pretty grim picture. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Cross, who is joining us to discuss this issue. How are you doing, Matt? Uh, thanks for taking time for, for uh, talking to us. I'm very well, Tommy. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. Matt, so uh, just recently, the story broke out about uh, yet another hen harrier uh, being killed or, or found dead or almost dead on a grouse moor. And uh, there's an issue going on for uh, quite a while uh, with uh, raptor prosecution or killing um, those endangered birds. And I just want to qualify here uh, that hen harriers are classified as a least concern globally. However, in the UK, they critically endangered. There's a, there's a major issue with the population, and yet they're still being killed. Would you like to um, maybe explain to our listeners very broadly what is an issue and how that situation looks like? Okay, so a very quick introduction to what a hen harrier is first, perhaps for, for listeners who don't know. Um, a hen harrier is a ground-nesting bird of prey. Uh, which is quite uncommon in birds of prey. They tend to be tree nesting or cliff nesting. Uh, hen harriers nest on the ground. They particularly like the kind of heather moorland habitats which are created and maintained for grouse shooting. So in a lot of ways, a grouse moor is a really good place for a hen harrier to be. It's the kind of habitat it likes. Um, they, they hunt... Um, various sort of um, small mammals um, and young birds and what have you um, on the ground. And they they work in a very distinctive way. If you ever watch a hen harrier, it hunts in a very distinctive way. It hunts like a spaniel hunts in a sort of quartering pattern across the ground. And it relies on panicking things out there and then grabbing them. Um, They're beautiful, beautiful birds. The males particularly are absolutely stunning birds. They're ghost grey with black wingtips. And if you ever see a male hen harrier, it's completely unmistakable. You would never think it was anything else. The females are a bit duller looking, um, but the males are really very strikingly beautiful birds. 
are they are there a different coloration because the uh, uh, females tend to sit on the on the nest and for better kind of camouflage is that I, the reason I, i'd imagine so yes i'm i'm not a, a sort of professional ornithologist to to tell you really but i would have thought so yes because mm -hmm. they have to nest on the ground they need to hide um whereas obviously the, the males have a sort of um a need to display and what and whatever so yeah i'd, I'd think that would be the reason <laughs> the, the, the conflict with grouse shooting is a very very complicated thing essentially hen harriers will predate grouse chicks now Grouse shooting relies entirely on wild birds. Grouse are not bred in captivity and released onto moorland. Any grouse that you were to shoot um, it is a wild bird. Um, and large numbers of hen harriers, we know this from a study that took place in the southwest of Scotland, a place called Langham. Large numbers of hen harriers on moorland can reduce the grouse density such that there are not enough grouse there for you to shoot. Okay. So they can have a negative effect on grouse shooting. There's no doubt about that. Now, that is not a justification for killing them. I'm never going to try and justify killing them. But it's important that we understand the facts in the round here. And certainly one of the key facts is that large numbers of hen harriers can render grouse shoots unviable. Okay. Um, so Sorry, do I, I have a question. Like, What do you mean by viable and not viable? Because is that depends on the number of shooters um, that are going for a shoot, or how does that work? Okay, sure. Y yes. I, what I mean really there is commercially unviable. Mm. So it would mean that there would not be... So when, when people shoot grouse, they shoot what's called a shootable surplus. Okay? Mm -hmm. So in the spring, gamekeepers will go out onto the moor, they'll count how many grouse they have, they'll count how many chicks are with the hen grouse, and they'll see how many grouse they expect to have in the summer. And based on that, they'll say, okay, we can shoot a certain number of birds on a certain number of days. A large number of hen harriers on a moor will mean that there are not enough grouse on that moor for, that, for it to be commercially viable, to sell adequate days to, to meet its costs, essentially. Right. Okay. Right. Um, now, as I said before, that is not a justification for killing hen harriers. Okay. Nothing justifies killing hen harriers but it is an important part of the context of understanding that conflict. Yes. Um, hen harriers are strictly legally protected in the UK. They're what we call a Schedule 1 bird, which means they have the highest level of legal protection. And that's because they're, they're very rare birds, um, particularly in England. We have rather more of them in Scotland, um, where we have very strong island communities of hen harriers. Um, but in England, they are an extremely rare bird, so they are, they are subject to very high level legal protection. They certainly are killed by some gamekeepers working on some grouse moors. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and we know that from, from various sources of evidence. Uh, there was, for example, a, a gamekeeper filmed shooting a hen harrier um, in the northeast of Scotland. Um, and we know from various evidence, we, we found quite recently there was a, a hen harrier found shot dead on a moor in Yorkshire. A couple of days ago, there was... A, as you mentioned before, there was a hen harrier found um, in a trap, actually not far from where I live um, in the southwest of Scotland. Uh, a few weeks before that, there was a hen harrier found dead in a trap in Perthshire. So they are killed by some gamekeepers on some grouse moors. And that does have a, a harmful effect on the hen harrier population. And, and this is uh, illegal shooting. So there is no way to apply for a sort of a exemption for gamekeepers to legally uh, shoot hen harriers? You could apply, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't get it. Okay. So there is a legal mechanism that allows you to apply for a license. You're not going to get a license for a hen harrier. No chance. Okay. So we can say 100% sure that these are illegal actions. These are illegal actions. Definitely. Okay. Yes. The, the big issue with hen harriers essentially is how widespread is this problem okay now it's it's criminality so how widespread is any crime we don't know because by the very nature of crime it's hidden mm -hmm. so we don't know and there, there are contesting um streams of evidence on that and at one extreme you'll have people say every every grouse moor gamekeeper's doing this 
They're all killing them, and it's not just the hen harries. They're killing every bird of prey that comes onto them all. In the other extreme, you'll have people who say, oh, it's a tiny, tiny number of people doing this. Um, it's very, very few. The truth lies somewhere in between, as it always yeah. does with these things. Yes. You know, what interests me in is, like, I know about the situation with, with grouse and protecting habitat for grouse in the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is kind of um, by now a common theme on my podcast where I'm kind of saying, oh, you know, we should all adapt the models that is in the United States for various, you know, whether it's shark fishing or managing game and so on. But my point is that in my head, before I get interested in, the, in this particular issue, Protecting uh, habitat for grouse was, in my head, and based on my knowledge, very positive for the environment because you're protecting habitat, and if you're protecting habitat for grouse, you're protecting habitat for a lot of other animals, predators, birds of prey, and, and you know mammals, and so on and so forth. But I guess the issue is that uh, that's not the case if all the other animals are getting uh, essentially killed on those grouse grouse. Okay. Board. Grouse shooting, the way it is practiced in the UK, um, does depend on very heavy levels of predator control. Okay, mm -hmm. now most of that is legal predator control: foxes, stoats, weasels, um, and crows, various crow species. Okay, mm -hmm. they are legally controlled very, very heavily on grouse moors. If you were to go onto a, a top grouse moor, you would not see a fox. Oh. You would not see a stoat. You would not see a weasel. You would see a crow if it was a very lucky or very nervous crow. Huh. Okay? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to have as many grouse as you can, uh -huh. and you do that by controlling the habitat, but also by suppressing those predators. So it's almost like a farming. It, it does have, yes. Yeah, I would accept that there are, there are aspects of farming to it. The difference is, that farming, obviously, you're working with captive stock that you've introduced, mm -hmm. whereas grouse shooting, they are wild birds. Yes. Um, but you are artificially manipulating the, the, the situation to have the maximum possible number of those. Now, some people find that very ethically questionable, and I understand that. But the, what I'd say to that is that, first of all, the UK has unusually high numbers of generalist predators. We have lots of foxes. We have lots of crows, particularly. Okay, so we have created a habitat. Sorry, not a habitat. A landscape in the UK that is very friendly to those types of animals. Um, and personally, I think it's reasonable that if we've created a habitat or a set of habitats that are friendly to them, that we also create a set of habitats that are hostile to them. Mm -hmm. And those grouse moors, because of that very heavy level of predator control are very, very important habitats for a lot of ground nesting birds, okay? Aha. Uh -huh. So... Including hen harrier. Including hen harriers. It's part of the reason hen harriers love grouse moors. Yeah. Because if you're a hen harrier on a grouse moor, you're not going to get eaten by a fox, right? Hmm. Because you've got a team of gamekeepers who are out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sorting out the foxes. So you're not going to get taken by a fox. So hen harriers, yes, but also things like curlews, lapwings, golden plover, all those birds which are in really very serious conservation state in the UK, they flourish on grouse moors. And there's very strong evidence of that. And there's very strong evidence that that is related to predator control on those moors. And is there a problem with illegal killing of those birds as well? Or because they are not birds of prey, they kind of uh, gamekeepers don't have a problem with them? The latter. There, there's no issue with the, with the illegal killing of um of those ground nesting birds um I, I i don't know a gamekeeper that wouldn't be delighted to see curlews and lapwings oyster catchers golden plovers on their moor i am you know what 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 you're describing i am wondering if that's not the difference like i like to say a a difference between american hunting and european hunting mm -hmm. and but and just uh this is just my own personal kind of distinction and how I draw that distinction is that um, what I call American way of hunting is there's a one or two people going into the wilderness, they're camping, they're 
kind of close to the nature. They're trying to kill an animal and, and harvest the meat. And this is how it goes. It seems to me like European way of hunting is very much, um, I suppose, commercialized for the want of the better word, where there is an estate and there is a dinner and the people are coming in and everything is very posh and very expensive. And is that the problem that is caused by that? Because you said like, oh, this has to be uh, commercially viable. So obviously we need to, in other words, the... Uh, the estate needs to make money to make sure they can cover the cost of, of, of the shooting guests being in and still make some profit of it. While if we have a model of grouse shooting, like, hey, here's a piece of land, parcel of land, and we have that number of permits to uh, shoot grouse on it. And based on uh, scientific evidence, we know we can shoot this much surplus of the birds and giving the probability of success this is how many licenses or tags we're going to issue and everybody can you know draw or buy or whatever to do uh, get attacked and go and shoot grouse and then that would eliminate the problem that oh we need to have absolutely this number of grouse on the moor because otherwise nothing gonna work okay yeah no it's the short answer to that. Yes and no is a slightly longer answer. So let me expand. Okay. Um, it's not as simple as that in that you, you could you could do what a lot of people would like to do and get rid of what we call driven grouse shooting, okay? Mm -hmm. So driven grouse shooting relies on very high numbers of birds on the ground. Then a team of beaters drives those birds over paying guns who will shoot them, okay? Now, you could get rid of that. Um, but if you did that, then you lose a whole sort of history and heritage that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. You you lose the jobs of the people who work on those moors, and yeah. you lose a huge source of income into rural communities. Okay, and people pay very very serious money to shoot driven grouse. Yes, um, and there are there are places, particularly in Scotland, where you would really hammer their economies if you pulled grouse shooting out of them. And you move to the kind of low intensity model of grouse shooting that you're talking about. Um, so it, it's not just as simple as, you know, move to, to a low intensity permit based system. Mm -hmm. the, the other reason I think the, the comparison doesn't stack up is that obviously the UK is much, much smaller than the United States. And we have much less land and we have much less publicly owned land. Okay. So in the United States, you are fortunate in that you have, you know, national parks, you have um, Bureau of Land Management managed land, you have lots of, of state-owned land. In the UK, we have much less publicly owned land. Yes. Um, so if you take driven grouse shooting out of those places where it's currently practiced, another land use is going to replace it. Um, it it's not going to stay as as lovely Heather Mullen that people just roam about on, it's going to get turned into something else. A farmland, for for example, and then there will be no birds well, and no wildlife at all. Well, where I live, I live in the southwest of Scotland. I live on the border of Esher and Galloway. And if you'd been here, let me think, in the 1950s, this would, there would have been big grouse moors right around where I live now. Now, those are conifer plantations. Huh. Um, Huge, enormous conifer plantations. Um, actually, all planted with American trees. They're planted with Sitka spruce, which is an American tree. Mm -hmm. and that, to my mind, is a much less beneficial land use than grouse shooting. Absolutely. Because there's just nothing in there. There are roe deer in there. And there are red deer in there. But you lose all those ground nesting birds. Okay, they are They are gone. Nothing wipes out ground nesting birds like commercial conifer plantation. Oh yeah, and that's that's even in in Ireland a big problem where uh, there is a problem with with uh, uh, water uh, being being polluted by those plantations, and yes. they, these these are essentially timber plantations, and they're pretty much dead as yeah. as far as uh, wildlife goes. Yeah, so I, I think if you, we we have to ask ourselves when we're considering grouse shooting. And the problems that go with it, and there are problems with it, we wouldn't deny that for one minute. What would replace it if we took it away? Yeah. Okay. 
And the, my view is, based on what I see around me and the experience, the lived experience of people in rural Scotland, is that grouse shooting is replaced by commercial forestry. Mm-hmm. Um, and commercial forestry is a much, much less beneficial land use than than grouse shooting is in biodiversity terms. No doubt about it. Yes. So is that situation like uh, I, I guess very common on the when we're talking about the conflict between like so called conservation conflict between shooters and hunters and and people who would like to opposing that um, and and these are all well meaning folks uh, that with the absence of something so let's say there are groups who are who are uh, opposing in this case grouse shooting or maybe trophy hunting in Africa and because this is pretty much the same issue but the problem is if they succeed they actually the net result will be exactly the opposite to what they're trying to do because they're trying to protect more nature and have a more wildlife but what they try, what if they successful and then actually they're going to end up with less wildlife and less habitat it's, 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 that's the same same problem isn't it i think that is a very real possibility yes now, we can't predict the future, we don't know, but I think it is a very real possibility that actually those people, the vast majority of whom are well-intentioned, okay, if they get what they want and they get an end to grouse shooting, then actually it'll have very, very serious negative effects on ground nesting birds particularly, but on um, on wildlife in general, yes. And ironically, one of the worst things to suffer will be the hen harrier, because a commercial forest, once it's grown up, is no use whatsoever for hen harriers. Hmm, absolutely. And the other thing about commercial forestry is, even if you don't plant that particular piece of moorland, if you plant trees next to it, they become a, a, a headquarters for foxes and crows and the things which will predate the hen harrier chicks anyway. So uh, the great irony of the hen harrier grouse moor situation is that grouse moors are the ideal habitat for hen harriers. They love them, um, but they can also be the worst place for hen harriers because on some of those moors they are illegally killed. Yes, the stats are are quite quite frightening about their uh, mortality and a, and a study I, I even uh, found the, an article in Nature that was um, kind of analyzing the uh, number of uh, of hen harriers that are uh, is a pattern of disappearing over a, a grouse moorlands, which is. Yes, not good. So, Matt, what's the what's the solution? Because it seems like uh, it's it's a it's a very difficult situation. Because on one end, we're trying to uh, protect the moorland and habitat, but at the same time, bad things are happening there. And uh, well, you said that there's no doubt about it that hen harriers can have an impact on grouse population and. Uh, commercial viability of of that operation but if that operation is gone then you know hen harriers are gone as well so it it seems like like there's like no matter which way you turn it's it's bad well tommy if i knew the solution i'd go and get an eighty thousand pound a year job at natural england um but right. no I, that's a, that's a bit flippant of me but okay i, I think th- the first part of the solution is that people absolutely have to stop killing hen harriers, right? That has to end. Grouse moors have to find a way to live with hen harriers, okay? But equally, people have to live with grouse moors. Now, what's being trialed in England at the moment, which I think is a really positive thing, even though it's been it's been very harshly criticised mm-hmm. um, by certain elements of the conservation community, is something called hen harrier brood management, Mm -hmm. okay? Where essentially what happens is if you have more than a certain number of hen harrier nests on your moor, uh, Natural England staff will take the chicks out of one one or more of those nests, they'll take them away, they'll rear them in captivity, and then they'll release them Mm -hmm. so that your piece of moorland is not getting a massive hen harrier burden, okay? But at the same time, there is a legal management option that means that your grouse shooting is not going to get wiped out by hen harriers. Yeah. So that there are there are middle ways that we can explore and that we can find on these things. 
but they depend on us agreeing that both grouse shooting and hen harriers have a right to carry on in the uplands. Um, and frankly, the problem is that as long as people kill hen harriers illegally, um, then it's it becomes tougher and tougher every day to make the argument for grouse shooting. Yeah. Um, and that has to stop. There's no doubt about it. And I'm speaking here as, as somebody who has personal friends who are grouse moor gamekeepers. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I'm not, I don't believe all grouse moor gamekeepers are bad guys. I don't believe all grouse moor gamekeepers are killing hen areas. They're not. They're not. But there's certain certain group that that does because we we know that and that's and that's an interesting that's an interesting question because uh, really people who are doing that people who are killing hen harriers you can say on one hand they um, I I I believe in their mind they're doing good for shooting they're doing good for managing the moorland and having a lot of grouse but mm-hmm. actually they only giving ammunition for the opposition. They only making situation for hunters and shooters worse by doing that. Absolutely. As there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that a colleague of mine at Shooting Times, a chap called Patrick Laurie, I think put it very well um, when he said, um, now I can't get his exact words, but I think it was when we get the post-mortem for shooting in the UK, the verdict will be suicide. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I saw that tweet. Yeah, because absolutely, these these people are are providing the most powerful argument against shooting. The most penetrating and persuasive argument against shooting is being provided from by people from within shooting, <laughs> um, and it's being provided by the illegal persecution of birds of prey. Now. It, the thing is, Tommy, it's very easy for you and I, right, to sit here and have a go at those people. Yeah. It's tougher if you're that gamekeeper with your boss breathing down your neck saying, why have we not got enough grouse to shoot as many days as last year? Why am I getting fewer and fewer days every year? Mm. You know, and on a human level, I can sympathize with the, the that individual gamekeeper who says, I'm just going to have to shoot them. I'm just going to have to deal with this hen area problem. I'm just going to have to shoot them. I'm just going to have to trap them. Yeah, I'm not condoning it in any way. It is absolutely morally wrong. But I want to make a living. I understand it. Yeah. yeah, you know, if it was my job, and if you're a gamekeeper, your job goes with your house, you know, your family home. It goes with everything. If it was my job that was on the line, I would, I could understand why people would feel tempted to do that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Even even though in the long run they're they're actually uh, damaging themselves because if yes. the, if the, if, yes, the, if the grouse you know, shooting is gone, then equally their house and their bill paying capacity is gone. Sure, but you know what? Human beings don't always do the thing which is the smartest thing in the long term. Mm. Often we look at the first problem that's right in front of us and try and solve that, don't we? Yeah, that's human nature. Yeah, and um, you know. And it is easy for us. It is easy for us to to criticize people who are doing that, but it's a tough situation to be in. Yeah, you know, what we need to do is we need to get the we need to get that industry to change its expectations. Uh huh. Yes. You know, that's what we need to do. Uh, we need to deal with those people who are who are pushing this, who are driving it, and we need to get people to to reconnect with the fact that they are dealing with wild birds and that that situation is unpredictable and um, it is going to vary from year to year, um, you know, and that we just have to live with that and cope with that. Yes. And is it like that change of the industry? Is it not what we what we already mentioned that uh, perhaps moving into the model that is less intensive uh, shooting, there is a l- less shooters and, you know, obviously the cost of the, uh, operation needs to be cut as well um, to still make a margin because uh, I, I think that from what we're saying and what you're saying at least what I understand what you're saying uh, the situation how it is right now it, it cannot continue and, and it has to change and I, I, I think that the only way is to move to less intensive uh, grouse shooting or perhaps uh, driving prices for grouse shooting in a in a, in a, in a 
uh, format like it is right now higher. So for less shooters or less birds shot, the estates can still make the same margin. Quite possibly. I mean, grouse shooting is already incredibly expensive. Mm. Um, really horrendously expensive. All driven shooting in the UK is is expensive. Can you give it? Can you, can you give an example off the top of your head? What would be uh, like? A, I don't know. Is it day or week uh, of of grouse shooting? No, you, you pay per bird. Okay. Okay. Um, essentially, the way driven shooting works in the UK um, is you would right. So let's say me and you and half a dozen friends decided we all wanted to go shooting. Mm-hmm. We'd we find an estate that was offering some shooting. And we'd say, we'd like to shoot, let's say, a 150 bird day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, I, grouse shooting prices jump up and down. You you can pay £95 a bird <laughs> for driven grouse shooting. That's pretty expensive. Um, it's horrifically expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you'd generally pay somewhere between £40 and £50 a bird driven pheasant shooting. Mm-hmm. But grouse shooting, yeah, you're looking at twice that, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is already very, very expensive. Um, so, you know, and the economics of it are, are quite difficult because you, you reach a point where actually it simply isn't, it isn't viable. There isn't a business model that makes it viable. Huh. Um, but I, I'm not sure we need one huge change to make it work. Mm-hmm. I think we need a lot of little changes. We need changes in people's expectations. We need changes in um, in the kind of culture of things, and we need people to to kind of be reasonable and to give a bit, and to say actually, grouse shooting is a is a, a a perfectly acceptable land use, and we have to find ways that you know we can we can make that work alongside hen harriers, like for example the brood management that's being trialed in England at the moment. Yes, I have a one more question. Um... And I'm wondering what is your opinion on that because, uh, and and obviously I'm I'm not hesitating as that question because I'm kind of completely new to the to the to the whole issue. the The particular issue with the hen harrier that is, you know, let's say right now in a, in a news cycle, that bird mm-hmm. was actually found trapped in a spring trap on the 11th of May, right? Right now okay. we have 16 of July. So it yep. seems to me like the whole, let's call it in the air quotes, media campaign was carefully curated. It wasn't a situation to me like, oh, we found another bird in a trap. It's horrible. Uh, and, and we have all that discussion. It was almost nothing. And then the two months later, we have this big... Uh, kind of blow up. Oh, the, that bird was, you know, there's a there's a videos on YouTube and this and that and something else. And this is like a, you know, I'm just wondering like how did that happen? Because I had to question, you know, kind of is it ha- it didn't yeah. happen organically. It was kind of curated. No, no. It didn't. Hey, look, every year on on so grouse shooting the grouse shooting season in the UK opens on the 12th of August. Yes. Okay, and it is almost a joke now that we talk about our 12th of August eagle, <laughs> okay? Because come the 12th of August, we will get a big press splash about somebody earlier in the year having killed an eagle or having killed a hen okay. harrier, okay? It is carefully orchestrated, very carefully orchestrated. And actually, we had an excellent example of that um, on the 13th of August, 2018. The grouse shooting season 2018 opened the 13th of August because that was the Monday. Um and at 5 a.m. on the 20th of August, sorry, on the 13th of August, um, a scientific paper, a very, very questionable scientific paper, quite frankly, mm-hmm. um, was published that alleged that grouse shooting had caused catastrophic declines in the numbers of mountain hares in the northeast of mm-hmm. Scotland. Now, it was published on the 13th of August. Um, on the first day of the grouse shooting season, it was done very cynically so that basically a press release went out the Friday beforehand, um, giving a sort of precy of all this, an embargoed press release, Mm -hmm. giving a precy of what this study was going to say. Then it comes, the study itself comes out at 5 a.m. on the Monday. So all the Monday papers are carrying the information from the press release. 
before anybody involved in shooting can look at it and respond to it. Okay. So yes, there is some very cynical and well orchestrated media work that goes on um, with this stuff. No doubt about it. And we know that we'll get something on, will it be the 12th again this year? Uh, yes, it'll be the 12th this mm-hmm. year um, of August. That's the way it goes. Mm. You know, you're absolutely right. All I'd say to qualify that slightly is there is a general tendency to not report these things whilst the police investigation is active. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, often the police ask for it not to be reported for a certain period of time. So some of that delay will have been will have come from the police asking for it not to be reported. Mm-hmm. But absolutely, some of the delay is so that they can make their films and get their campaigning material out. Ah, yes. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that kind of confirms what I, what I observed being kind of completely the, not involved, at least to that point, into, in the whole issue. Okay, Matt, listen, so uh, uh, f- finally, if you have a, uh, a absolute power to do something about it, okay, like a, like a uh, you know, ruler of the hen harriers and driven grouse shooting <laughs> industry, what would uh-huh. be, you know, one or maybe three steps or actions that you would take to address that problem? Now, I put you on the spot um, here. You might not be uh, comfortable in, in, in addressing that, but I, I try anyway. I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go, Tommy. Right. The first thing I would do is I would deal with not the gamekeepers who implement the, the policies, but the higher up, more powerful people, sorry, the more powerful people who drive that. Okay. So I would put them in jail. That's the number one thing I would do. Um, number two, I would, well, if I was going to be a good scientist, I'd wait till the end of the Hen Harry Brood Management Trial and see what results that produces. But not being a scientist, I would expand Hen Harry Brood Management um, and I would allow a sensible scheme whereby when there are a lot of hen harriers on one particular grouse moor, some of those can be taken off and and reared in captivity. Um, And then number three, I would, um, I'd make some some highly technical changes to policing and the way these things are policed, which are probably too dull for me to go into, but I'd make some highly technical changes to the way these things are policed so that the police were able not campaigners, but the police yeah. were able to deal very robustly with anybody who carried on killing hen harriers. Yeah. That's what I As mean. a deterrent. Yes. Is, is there Absolutely. anything that, uh, and this is, I guess, a question that I'm always asking on the, on the end of those, those things, is there anything that regular uh, folks, regular hunters and shooters can do to help the situation? Now, someone may, may argue that uh, people who are paying, you know, eighty or, or ninety pounds per bird, are not exactly the regular folks and shooters, you know. But still, you know, there are regular shooters who are concerned about the future of their sport and they're concerned about the future of their lifestyle. Yeah. And is there anything they Absolutely. can do about it? The, uh, yes, yes, categorically there is. The, the, the first thing they can do is if they know about criminality, they can report it to the police, okay? If you know that people are committing offences against birds of prey, report it to the police. I am not a believer in reporting that to campaign groups or to NGOs. They are not law enforcement agencies. Report it to the police, okay? So if you have information about, about criminality, report it to the police. That is the first and most important thing. Your everyday hunter, shooter, anybody who's in the outdoors and i presume do. you can do that okay. confidentially as well so you're not worried about your yes safety. you can that can be done confidentially through through crap through um, a charity called crime stoppers it's a very well-known charity mm. in the uk which is completely confidential and i discussed crime stoppers with a very senior police officer a while ago and he assured me that there are times when he had investigations where they really could have done with knowing who reported it and they can't find it out so yes it can be reported completely confidentially through crime stoppers that's the number one thing The number two thing that people can do is where there are shooting businesses which are associated with with persistent criminality towards 
um, any form of birds of prey or any form of wildlife, take nothing to do with them. Okay? Don't shoot with them. Don't beat for them. Don't pick up for them. Don't buy things from them. Don't sell things to them. Have nothing to do with those businesses. Okay? And you you know, the, the, the Russian billionaires who come over here to shoot driven grouse, they don't care, yeah. right? We're not going to stop them. That That's not going to change just because they're going to an estate where there's been criminality. But that estate depends on people like me, on everyday normal people um, shooting, uh, sorry, beating for them, picking up for them, making their estate work, making their shoot days work. Okay? Where you have an estate or a shoot that has a persistent problem with criminality take nothing to do with them that's my advice right. okay perfect uh matt is there anything else that you would like to add to 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 what we already said all i'd like to add to that is there are many excellent grouse more gamekeepers mm. okay and i think it's really really sad really tragic that the work of a lot of excellent highly conservation minded grouse more gamekeepers constantly gets overshadowed by this issue okay there are there are grouse more gamekeepers out there who are proud of their hen harriers okay and are delighted that the work that they do in predator control and habitat management allows there to be hen harriers on their moors mm -hmm. okay and there are grouse more gamekeepers out there who do fabulous work for ground nesting birds some of the the, the best practitioners of practical ground nesting bird conservation are grouse more mm. gamekeepers right So please, please do not take from this conversation the idea that every Grouse Moor gamekeeper is some sort of murderous <laughs> villain who's out there wiping out hen harriers. They're not. There are excellent gamekeepers out there who do fabulous conservation work and who at the same time generate a world-class shooting experience that brings people from across the Atlantic, from all around the world to the UK. You know, and that's something we should be, we should be really proud of and really happy about. And I, I would not want those people to be tarred with this brush of um, of crime when they are not criminals. They are good, honest, hardworking people. Uh, Matt, uh, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I, I think you're very clear on that. Thanks, Tommy. Nice to speak to you.